Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Beth Stewart and on behalf of the Texas Oral Health Coalition and our conference partners, the Texas Health Institute and the Texas Department of State Health Services Oral Health Improvement Program, I'd like to thank you for joining us for the 2020 Texas Oral Health Virtual Conference. I'm excited to introduce you to today's moderator, Dr. Rhonda Stokely. Dr. Stokely is the State Public Health Dental Director and the Texas Department of State Health Services Health Screening and Oral Health Unit Manager. Please take it away, Dr. Stokely. Thank you, Beth. So welcome everybody. I'm happy to, to be a part of our virtual Texas Oral Health Conference this year, and, and this is our kickoff presentation. Um, I just wanna check, can everyone hear me okay? All right, I got some yeses, good. So our presentation is Sugar, Sugar Everywhere, a panel discussion on the harmful effects of sugar and what we can do about it. Today, we're gonna to take on a big topic in just a single hour. Sugar truly is everywhere. Our diets are full of it, in the obvious places like our sugar-sweetened beverages, but in all kinds of foods that we don't even think of as being sweet. You've heard the adage, all things in moderation, but in general, Americans are not moderating their sugar intake. Too much is bad for us, yet here we are. So what can we do about it? What is our role as healthcare providers and health champions? So our learning objectives today are to discuss the impact of sugar and its prevalence, describe how to identify patients who need dietary counseling and when they should be referred to a professional, and describe what policymakers and organizations are doing to curb sugar consumption and then what we can do about it in our own work. So now let me introduce our three panelists. Each will give a brief dis um, presentation and then we'll have our panel discussion. After I've asked my questions, we'll take questions from the audience. Be sure to type your questions in the chat box and we'll get to all the questions that we can. Our first speaker, Ms. Kelly McCullough. Kelly is a clinical dietitian specializing in renal health, diabetes, weight control, and other health concerns. She is a sought after speaker in nutrition and team building topics, as well as school and community education programs. Kelly is a former registered dental hygienist practicing for 14 years in Texas, California, Oklahoma, and Japan. Our second speaker will be Ms. Karen Schwind. Karen is New Braunfels ISD Health Services Coordinator and Texas School Nurse Organization President Elect. She is a graduate of Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio, and is a nationally certified school nurse. She is a member of the National Association of School Nurses and a Johnson & Johnson School Health Leadership Fellow. Our third and final speaker is Dr. Paul Casamassimo. Dr. Casamassimo is a professor emeritus at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. He is also Chief Policy Officer of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry in Chicago. Dr. Casamassimo has authored over 400 publications in pediatric dentistry and recently represented AAPD in the Healthy Eating Research Project to develop national guidelines on beverage consumption in children zero to five years old. So please go ahead, Kelly, and lead off with your presentation. I'm very excited to be here to share this information today because it is something that is very close to my heart. Um, first first uh, slide that we have on the presentation, can we move to that, please? And then the next, please, ma'am. Okay. Um, our percentages of overweight and obesity in the United States have skyrocketed. From 1962, we had about 46% of our adults were in that, those categories. By 2010, 75% were. And now with 2010, it's done nothing but increase. Next slide, please. This is simply showing obesity, not obesity and overweight statistics. Uh, it does break it down into gender specific and also race specific, uh, basically showing that we all have this issue. It's affecting all of us. Uh, it's not something that is specific to one, one gender or one particular ethnicity. Next slide, please, ma'am. 
we, we need to keep in mind that carbohydrate and sugar are one and the same. And we need to keep that in mind as we go through these slides. Let's look at the next one, please. Let's check our nutrition labels. This particular label is an example of vitamin water. And you would think that vitamin water would just need to be water with vitamins, but no, they add carbohydrate slash sugar to it. And so I expanded the, 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 uh, these particular parts of the, of the nutrition labels to illustrate that there's 13 grams just in vitamin water alone. Next slide. Another example of a nutrition label, this is the energy drink Red Bull, does not diet Red Bull, but it has total carb of 40 grams, 39 of those are sugar. Uh, so specifically our drinks are an issue. Next slide, please, ma'am. Uh, this is showing a pie chart of our sugary drinks that they are a key driver for the for the added sugar that we have. Uh, yes, there's lots of there's other sugars that we that our body processes as carbohydrate, but sugary drinks have a big part of our added sugars uh, on a day to day basis. This is something that I bring out to the kids whenever I go to schools and I do a presentation for the kiddos about healthy eating and exercise, etc. I bring a lot of information to them about and I have teach them how to read the the label and I show them what it looks like, what they need to look for for carbohydrate and sugar. And uh, they're amazed, they're always amazed by how much carbohydrate and sugar is in the things that they're drinking and eating. Next slide, please, ma'am. Okay, these two sugars, fructose and glucose, are the main two sugars that we are processing that, that break down, because our complex carbohydrates break down into simple sugars. And so fructose, is something that with, of course, our uh, additives with fructose, but also the natural ones. Fructose is broken down in the liver. It's turned into triglycerides. Uh, it then becomes fatty liver when it processes in the liver and then some stays in the liver, it becomes fatty liver. Other fats go into the bloodstream, which causes a whole nother host of problems, which we'll go over in just a few minutes. And glucose, glucose is broken down in the liver. It's sent to the bloodstream. It then can be used to um, give us energy. Our brain signals the pancreas to create the hormone insulin. Insulin must be present in order for glucose to be absorbed into the tissues. It has to be there. Next slide, please, ma'am. The excess triglycerides in the liver from the fructose increases the risk of insulin resistance and diabetes. Type two diabetes is insulin resistance, and that is the most common form of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. It is not as common. However, the same problems can occur if it's not controlled. An overabundance of fat in the blood will lead to weight gain, blocked arteries, and heart disease. And we'll go over how that occurs in just a few minutes. Next slide, please, ma'am. Glucose is used for energy in our cells. Uh, the excess is stored as glycogen in the liver for fight or flight response. The rest is stored as fat especially women, we are very, very efficient at storing our extra glucose as fat because we're preserving the uh, persistence of the species. Uh, glucose is hanging around in the bloodstream when we have extra glucose because we don't have enough insulin. If we, if we have insulin resistance, we don't have enough insulin available. It's requiring more insulin to get the same amount of glucose into our tissues. Therefore, the glucose is sitting around waiting for that to occur. And when that occurs, it's doing damage in our blood in our uh, blood in our blood system in the process. Next slide, please. So the things that raise blood sugar are milk, anything that's starchy, such as rice, potatoes, pasta, bread, tortillas, things like that. Fruit, sweets, sweet drinks. Most people are shocked at the fact that the um, oh. Did we miss some slides? Okay. There, most people are shocked at the, at the fact that the, um, that milk is one of the problems with raising blood sugar. And um, that's something that I teach my, especially diabetic patients, people that are trying to control their blood sugar, that they don't need to be necessarily drinking milk as a beverage after the age of about two to three years old. Um, the, uh, the, the nutrition that we get from milk, we can get from all of our other foods once we're to the point where we have a full set of teeth and we're eating and we're doing what we need to do there. 
Fruit is something that comes with fiber. Natural fruit, like for instance, say an apple, it comes along, it has, yes, it has natural sugars, but it also has fiber and tons of other nutrients. When it's unadulterated, when it's not messed up, it will be able, it will, it will cause, um, uh, it tends to cause the, uh, the, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought with the, with the comment. Uh, the fruit has um, fiber with it and that's how nature packages it together for us, um, which is better for us than the way that we process it, over process it. Next slide, please. Okay, the, um, the damage from sugar or carbohydrate. The insulin increases fat storage. Um, there again, type two equals insulin resistance. Glucose remains in the bloodstream longer. The problem with the bloodstream, the glucose staying in the bloodstream longer is that it's similar. If you can, if you can think about it in terms of glass shards, it's not glass shards, but if we imagine it that way, if you can think in cartoons, imagine it being glass shards. And every time the heart beats, it just pumps those glass shards all over the place. And what they're doing is they're beating up against the sides of our blood vessels in every tissue that we have. What that, what that causes is that our, um, our blood vessels will either do one of two things. They're going to become sort of calloused and, and they will shrink. It's called atherosclerosis and it causes heart disease. Or it will damage the inside of the blood vessel causing an injury. Our body rushes to the area. It causes a blood clot to try to heal that area. That blood clot can then release and cause a stroke. This is why people with type to diabetes tend to be on the higher end of heart disease and stroke. And they are at a higher risk of heart disease and stroke, the same as someone who's already had a heart attack or a stroke. So that puts them in a very high risk category. Uh, so it's not good for glucose to remain in the bloodstream longer. That's why insulin resistance is an issue. It increases heart disease and stroke as well as kidney disease, retinopathy, neuropathy. Kidney disease, retinopathy, and neuropathy are things that are used, uh, that are, that are resulting from the teeny tiny little blood vessels in those organs being attacked and destroyed by the glucose in the bloodstream, staying in there way too long. So that is something that can be prevented. Next slide, please, ma'am. Okay, the brain reaction to sugar it's very, it's just like it releases dopamine. It's just like having an addiction to nicotine or any other drug. It impedes the appetite centers, causing more hunger, less satisfaction. And the more we have of carbohydrate slash sugar, the more we want. It's just the way our brain reacts to this particular stimulus. So next slide, please, ma'am. Okay, so the thing that we need to make sure we're doing is we need to be aware, we need to read our labels, we need to focus on high nutrient value foods. And examples of those are vegetables, fruits, beans, nuts, and seeds. And if we manage those in a, an appropriate manner, we can get everything that we need just from vegetables, fruits, beans, nuts, and seeds. I realize we eat other things and um, I don't tell people they can only eat these foods as a dietitian, but we know that we can get everything we need from these. Nature packages carbohydrate with fiber, so it's a much healthier way of, of consuming it. Starchy foods fill us up. They are great for countries that are having a problem with starvation. However, that's not our issue in the United States. So starchy foods do not need to be the bulk of our diet. They need to be the smallest amount on our plate, if at all. Um, and of course, any, I'm sure I, I triggered some questions as far as this goes, and we'll be answering those questions at the end of the presentation. Let me hand this off to Karen. Guess it would help if I unmuted and started my video. There we go. Uh, thanks, Kelly. That helps me to understand a little bit about my students that uh, have, have diabetes and what the uh, physiological process is. So I appreciate that very much. Uh, sugar, sugar everywhere. And what about in school? Um, I serve as the health services coordinator for New Braunfels ISD. And uh, this has been a challenge 
every year, as long as I can think about being a school nurse, uh, it's been a challenge to try to limit or decrease the amount of sugar in school and increase the nutritional capabilities that we can serve in school. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to explain a little bit about how laws and rules come into play in a school, uh, particularly in a local school district. Um, the school health advisory is appointed uh, by the school board, and this is actually a legislative piece that came through the Texas Education Code that each district has to have a shag. So that's what we refer to the School Health Advisory Council. Uh, the purpose of the council is to ensure local community values are reflected in the district's health education and instruction. So all of the health related pieces that must be approved uh, and and created by the local policies uh, regarding all wellness and health must then go through the shack, as well as any curriculum that is um, being taught to the students. Um, the members of the shack, the majority are to be parents. Um, that is defined by law. And we also have school administrators, teachers, school nurses, students, uh, multiple community members, uh, and healthcare professionals in particular, um, and, and could be as dentists as well as members. Um, the primary responsibility of the SHAC is to implement any nutrition guidelines, uh, plan for physical activity and fitness, review the health curriculum, and in specifically health curriculum, uh, and also the sexual, uh, sexual program for, that is taught to high school, middle school and high school students, and to develop and evaluate the wellness policy. So the two areas that the SHAC can very, very easily influence uh, the amount of sugar that we see in school is in curriculum in educating the students um, in the nutrition guidelines, which again, we have to follow some of those by the USDA and the FDA, uh, but also in developing and evaluating the wellness policy. So the wellness policy at a local level can be as detailed to exclude sugar products or can include some depending again on what the USDA says. Um, next slide, please. So school beverages and snacks. Um, back in the early 2000s, uh, we had a policy that said that no sodas would be sold during the school day. Um, all of our drink machines were to contain water and non-sugar beverages. Again, this was a guideline that came, came from the state back in 2003. Over the years, the guidelines for wellness have changed as legislators have changed, uh, as board members have changed. Um, the Texas Association of School Boards dictates a lot of our legal policy. And as that has changed as well as the Texas Education Agency guidelines, some of these have been lightened over the years. Uh, but again, based on the uh, school Health Advisory Council or the SHAC and the recommendations to the school board uh, that can affect um, what the details are as far as sodas and beverages being offered in schools. So if I can use my district as an example, um, we do not have sodas in any of our um, drink machines. Um, during the school day, the students are able to obtain water and non-sugar beverages. Um, although there are some uh, machines that do have candy items in them. Um, those uh, would be considered in the vending machine area. And those snacks are available to students, but as of the 2014-15 school year, they can only be available outside the federal reimbursement school meal program times. So during breakfast and during lunch, those machines are turned off. And those items are only available to students outside of the meal time, as we encourage and want our students to participate in the nutritional services that are offered by the school. Um, the local wellness policy then um, was supported from the Child Nutrition and Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, the Reauthorization Act of 2004. And that established the local school wellness policies. Uh, continually revised about every three to five years. Uh, our most recent, recent revision was during the 2016-17 school year. And again, the responsibility of the SHAC to make and approve those 
uh, new guidelines back then, and then to be reevaluating them on an on every other year basis um, has been uh, a result of the Texas Association of School Boards Legal Policy, which is FFA. Then we create a local FFA policy that, ad that addresses um, the following. That can be nutritional and promotion and education, um, our physical activities, school-based activities, um, our standards for food and beverages in coordination with um, child nutrition uh, department. We are able to um, provide for those. Um, promote students' health and reduce childhood obesity. Uh, as Kelly has explained to us, uh, the risk of obesity and the increase in obesity amongst our population, including our children, is a very much a concern. Uh, and then smart snacks, which can be sold in the cafeteria, um, those must meet USDA guidelines. And I've included a link um, in the slides so that you can access this information. Um, these slides, by the way, will be posted um, on the TOHC website after the presentation, so you would be able to access those uh, links there. And then lastly, squaremeals.org um, has a lot of very valuable information for local wellness policy. Um, creators. Um, there's, some, there's some templates for the policy which are very helpful and some guides for um, not only the smart snacks but all kinds of snacks that might be provided during the school day. Uh, next slide please. So there's squaremeals.org and the USDA. Uh, SquareMeals.org presents with us with nutritional standards for all foods sold in schools. So as I go through this list, uh, competitive food items must contain whole grains, 50% or the first ingredient of the non-grain food group. Uh, they have to have at least uh, a quarter cup of fruits or vegetables and 10% of the daily value of nutrients. So for all of this, the items that are sold um, either in our vending machines or in our cafeterias, they must meet these criteria. Um, this includes entrees sold as a la carte, um, our grain items, the total saturated and trans, total fats, saturated fats and trans fats have to be listed and, and required to a certain level. Um, there's a restriction on sugar, restriction on sodium and on caffeine. The next slide actually goes on to talk about sugar, and I'll get to that in a second to get, go into more detail there. Um, but the USDA does, does provide us with some, some options um, and suggestions for decreasing the amount of sugar we're providing each day. Um, not only what we sell in school, uh, but the cereal that we provide for breakfast is suggested to be lower in sugar if there is such a thing. <laughs> uh, unflavored low-fat milk. As Kelly mentioned, milk has a lot of um, sugar and carbs in it. Uh, so looking at the unflavored milk um, provides us with less, um, less sugar and carbs. 100% fruit juice with no added sweeteners is, is an important piece. And in fact, uh, again, at a local wellness policy level, our principals have opted to have um, fruit juice served uh, only every other day, some only two times a week, depending on the campus. Um, again, to decrease that amount of, of sugar that the kids are consuming at breakfast time. Um, limiting the portion si size based on the age and providing calorie free and low calorie options, particularly for our older students. Um, at the base of the slide are the links to both the squaremeals.org and the USDA recommendations. Uh, next slide. So this is where I wanted to uh, break down uh, the piece about sugar for all foods consumed in schools. Uh, sugar is ex an acceptable food item and you must have 35% of the weight from the total sugar as served. So exceptions to this would be dried or dehydrated whole fruits, um, nuts, um, vegetables with no added sweeteners, uh, unless there's a sweetener required for processing. Um, such as some very tart foods that might, might need a sugar accommodation. And there again is the uh, squaremeals.org reference for that. Next, please. Uh, for those that are school nurses that are attending, and for those of you just as an informational piece, um, there are several programs that are available for, uh, for us as school nurses to be able to educate our students. 
Uh, part of that piece is dental health care, and another huge part of that is nutrition. Um, and I've listed some, some options for you. Um, I like to point out the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, as they have a volume of information regarding wellness and health, um, nutrition, uh, dental health, um, and the Masonic Children and Family Services also have a fantastic um, teeth fan club that they will come into the school and, and assist in providing that education. As well as uh, the Colgate Bright Smiles and the DentalCare.com has guides for educators for oral health. The National Association of School Nurses has um, multiple references that are available um, on their website as well, and I list those here. Uh, then, then each area has different health uh, and dental health opportunities depending on um, what's available in their community. Uh, some have, some are very fortunate to be able to have um, buses and um, clinics that are able to, dental clinics that are able to come into the schools and that is always very welcomed. Um, next slide. And this is my contact information. Um, feel free to uh, send me a, a line if you have any questions at kshwind at mbisd.org and my phone number is listed as well. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. And I will now pass this off to Dr. Paul. Okay, start the video. All right. Hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's nice to be here and to uh, follow two excellent presentations. Uh, I'm going to focus on oral health and the effect of sugar on teeth. Uh, next slide. So the things I'm going to try to cover in the 10 minutes that uh, we all have had, uh, sugar and oral health, what we know currently, um, sugar in young children's diet and, and how much uh, and how they take it. And then the challenges for providers uh, who may be on this uh, webinar um, and both hands-on and in a little bit on advocacy uh, to control sugar in our society. Next slide. So I think most of you, uh, if you're in dentistry, you know the bottom uh, three ring sign. That's the Kai's diagram that uh, has been around forever that says when you put a bacteria together with sugar and a tooth that is susceptible to tooth decay, they, when they intersect, uh, you will get tooth decay. Um, the complete diagram you see is, is what's called the Fisher-Owens diagram. Susan Fisher-Owens is a pediatrician in California and she and her colleagues put together this uh, uh, diagram to show that um, it's not just the biological aspects of um, of caries that we need to be attentive to. There's the family or the patient, the family, and society. And uh, I know it's difficult to see that, but uh, uh, if you go to the literature, you can find the Fisher-Owens diagram and, and see all the different elements that can cause uh, tooth decay above and beyond the biological um, uh, aspects that most of us uh, are used to. Uh, if we focus just on the mouth, we, we tend to fail largely because um, there are so many other factors that influence diet as our two previous speakers have, have uh, told us. Um, so uh, we need to consider things uh, in, that have social impact like food deserts, food insecurity, uh, highly processed foods that are inexpensive and many families uh, can only afford. Uh, we have to look at cultural values and the ability to uh, preserve food. Those are all elements that figure into uh, the effect of sugar on teeth. Next slide. So um, these are just some facts. We've, we've gotten a bunch uh, of facts today so far. Um, uh, if you look at kids four to eight years old, uh, the big point here is that 99% ingest empty calories. In other words, they take in uh, high sugar diets that have very, other, very little other nutritional value. So no vitamins, no proteins. And, and so that's a problem because they get filled up on, on sugar as we heard uh, earlier. Um, 
it, when in the group that that I'm particularly interested in, the preschoolers, um, 60% of those kids ingest added sugars above and beyond what they need uh, uh, for appropriate nutrition. And um, if you look at the next uh, category, uh, about a quarter of kids eat no fruit or vegetables on a typical day, and about half of kids will have some form of sugary drink. So um, we know that uh, consumption uh, of sugar is higher among those with lower income and people of color, uh, and uh, the hidden sugars are the other element. They're, they're buried in diets, of, in fact, in many cases in foods that are purported to be healthful and beneficial and nutritious. Next slide. So um, as, as uh, we heard earlier, um, the interest in, in nutrition is, is largely driven by obesity. And uh, if you look at the preschool population, which is the red uh, or, or purplish um, graph here, you can see that it has gone up and, and is on the upward swing. Um, and we know from, from adulthood and from uh, many, many sources that obesity is associated with diabetes, asthma, anxiety, uh, depression, low self-esteem. Um, and if you're an obese child, you will likely be an obese adult. So um, we really need to get a handle on our sugar consumption above and beyond teeth. And I would encourage everyone who's in the dental field listening to this, that uh, we have a role in uh, general nutrition uh, above and beyond uh, what, how sugar affects our uh, patients. Next slide. So um, sugar sweetened beverages or SSB, um, uh, it, it doubles essentially uh, in early childhood. Um, and if you're a, a minority child, um, you will consume more sugar sweetened beverages than other children. Um, and uh, you also uh, sugars are hidden in fruit flavored drinks. And again, there's a disproportionate uh, consumption among our, our poor and minority kids. Um, and then some uh, things, and you can see them in the grocery store and on TV, uh, fruit flavored drinks uh, very often have uh, as much sugar as a soda uh, or soda pop, as we say here in the Midwest. Um, and so um, you can look at that graph on the right, but it's basically just reiterates these points is that sugar is prevalent in our drinks and our beverages uh, for kids and uh, particularly in the preschool population. Next slide. So um, the sugar uh, that we have is, is intimately tied to uh, industry in our communities. Um, sugary drinks continue to be produced uh, in large quantities. Uh, corn sweeteners uh, are, are big business. Um, uh, as you know, the more refined and easier to use, the more karyogenic a carbohydrate is. And um, that's tied to, to lower cost and easy access and less preparation. Those things all go together to, um, to make this more of a problem. Um, if you watch TV uh, and watch kids shows, you, you know that uh, uh, sugar sweetened beverages are marketed to youth and to, to minority populations uh, in the media. Um, and then um, anyone who is of low income is really at a greater risk uh, for dental caries because of their sugar consumption, largely in, uh, in hidden sugars, but uh, just generally in their diet. Next slide. So let's translate this to some, some practical um, uh, issues. Uh, sugar and water fluoridation are really the keys in, in oral health counseling related to tooth decay. Um, and if you want to really be successful, you should incorporate the, the uh, Fisher-Owens diagram and begin to assess not just the amount of sugar, the amount of, of, of beverage uh, containing sugars, but really to um, look at the whole family, the whole concept, the community, 
and cultural practices and really understand uh, how sugar and uh, carbohydrate fit into the family's diet uh, and what those influences are. And then make it a discussion, don't, not a directive. We fail largely in our counseling because we tell people this is what you've got to do rather than say, how can we do this to reduce the effect of sugars? Um, and then uh, begin to incorporate uh, our recommendations and what families tell us they can do into our, our therapies and our, our counseling and uh, uh, look at those periodically as we see uh, kids and families come back uh, over time. Um, you, one of the things in, in the dental profession, we're all precision oriented and absolutists. And the reality is, is that our goal may be to minimize the effect, not eliminate the effect. So, um, and it may be a multi-step, multi-stage, long-term project to try to shape the diet of someone to have less of a dental implication. Next slide. So uh, I'm gonna quickly say the beverage the recommendations under five. Um, the purpose was to uh, uh, put beverages in the context of an overall child's diet or preschooler's diet. Uh, from our standpoint, um, the, the basic principles of beverage counseling still uh, apply. Reduce sugar overall, no going to bed with a bottle, no sugar containing liquids in bottles or sippy cups or what I call walking sugars, uh, no liquids after brushing, uh, hopefully with fluoridated toothpaste. And then when you have a choice to drink water, preferably drink fluoridated water from the tap. Um, if you drink 100% juice, um, uh, you know, that's possible in the guidelines and I'll, and I'll let people, uh, uh, I'll talk about how you get to those. But um, it's, the recommendation is fruit is preferred because of the fiber element to drinking 100% juice. Um, if you need to have a walking drink, if you, if you have an addict that needs a sippy cup walking around a little three-year-old, make sure it has fluoridated water in it. That's your first choice. And then milk and 100% juice should be taken at meals uh, and snacks. Those are the preferred uh, fluids. Next slide. Okay, that's all I have to say. You can look at Healthy uh, Eating Research. Go to their website. You can get this information in, uh, in more detail. I went through that pretty quick, but uh, they, they have it for one-year-olds, uh, two to four, and then five-year-old kids. Uh, and, and it's all based on how beverages and sugar should fit into um, a diet. The last comment I'll make, which I kind of uh, jumped through pretty quick, was um, we don't recommend uh, uh, non-nutritive sweeteners anymore. That's been the biggest change and that's a challenge uh, for all of us because we've been using diet drinks uh, as substitutes for sugared sweetened beverages and that in this five uh, and under population is now a no-no. So I'll stop there and uh, I think we go to questions. All right, great, thank you. Thank you all three panelists. I really appreciate that information. Um, so now I've got a, a few questions for y'all and then we'll go from there to um, field some questions from the audience. My first question is for all three of the panelists um, and I'll have you provide your answer in the order that you spoke so that way we're not tripping over each other. So to start us off, I'd like to, for you, each of you to give me an example of something you commonly see in your individual lines of work related to sugar consumption. I mean, what's just another day at the office, so to speak, in terms of the overconsumption of sugar? Um, and, and what kind of changes have you noticed with that over the course of your career? So Kelly, if you could start us with that answer. There's been um, less tendency to use the non nutritive sweeteners, as Dr. Paul was mentioning, um, that used to be the exact thing that people said, let's do something sugar free. And then the, so they would just do the sugar free variety of whatever. And now they're finding that those are not the best options for us. Um, so when I recommend uh, something that is a that is a beverage that's not going to be sugar filled, I can lean toward water, I lean toward 
unsweetened iced tea because we're from the south here in Texas and we tend to drink a lot more iced tea. Um, adults, uh, if they like their coffee, I recommend that they don't put a lot of other stuff in their coffee. Uh, like sugar and fat and that, you know, makes it a, a dessert, basically, uh, those kinds of things. So that's, it's, it sounds very boring, but it does take care of the thirst issue. Uh, and you don't have the added sugar in that process. It's better to eat your special occasion things. It's better if you're going to have something special, eat it instead of drinking it. Don't drink your calories. Thank you. Okay, Karen. Over approximately the last 10 years, um, nurses in the South Texas area have been responsible for screening for acanthosis nigricans. It's a, a marker on the neck that we look for uh, as a precursor, not, not a diagnostic piece, but as a precursor to type 2 diabetes. Uh, we call it the Texas Risk Assessment in Children for Type 2 Diabetes. And so as part of that process of screening, we review um, all students' necks based on the grade level that we're screening. And then we uh, measure their blood pressure at intervals and measure their height and weight and develop a BMI for them. Um, and then we are referring these students to their healthcare provider for follow-up. So over the years, I've seen an increase in these referrals, unfortunately. Um, we're seeing our students um, be more obese and, uh, and have more of a risk for the acanthosis microcans marker. Um, the flip side of that is we are not seeing the students necessarily being treated for that. Uh, many of our referrals don't come back to us or on follow-up we find out that uh, while well, you were really, this student was referred two years ago and we didn't do anything about it then, we're not going to do anything about it now. It's sort of an attitude that we oftentimes get from parents. So it's very much a concern from a medical standpoint um, and from a school nurse standpoint. Um, if I could answer with a second piece to that question, um, and that would be birthday parties at school. Uh, the, the extreme frosting that's on cupcakes is unbelievable. Now they make a cupcake, they put it all together and make it look like a cake. So it has, uh, I think sometimes two inches of icing on top of that cupcake. I'm, I'm all about celebrating birthdays for everybody except mine, of course. Uh, I'm all about kids celebrating their birthdays in school, but when you start to look at a classroom of 22 and realize that sometimes it's once or twice a week that they're having um, a very high sugary item as the treat when it could be um, a healthy choice or a healthy snack. Well, so, so with, the, with those massive cupcake um, birthday cakes, I know what you're talking about. Um, do you, so is that kind of up to each school or ISD as to whether they ban that sort of thing for, um, for school birthday celebrations or how does that work? Unfortunately, uh, the schools can make recommendations and suggestions for non-food items or, or low sugar items, but there is a law called Lauren's Law that says that we cannot ban cupcakes or celebrations of birthdays. Yes, I know. So even as a wellness, even as a shack to, to change the wellness policy, we're not able to exclude that birthday treat um, because, of those, of the, because of that law. Okay. Is that a Texas specific law? Yes, I believe so. I don't know about other states, but that is uh, Texas law. Okay. All right, Dr. Casmasimo. Yeah, my, mine is quick. I can tell you that in my uh, many decade career, the one thing that has become far more common is that uh, you rarely see uh, parents and children coming uh, to any sort of activity without a bottle. And so we have sippy cups, we have parents have a bottle of pop, and uh, one of the, mo the most uh, uh, revealing things to me was uh, a, a mother and her child both in like, you know, dressed in, in uh, tennis or, or athletic gear, let's put athletic gear, and the little girl mimicking her mother's mannerisms drinking from her water bottle, but the kid had uh, some kind of sugar drink in there. So um, it, it, they, the kids even bring them to their dental appointments and uh, seem to have no, um, you know, hesitation or the parents that they, they've got a bottle of 
of Coke or some other drink uh, in the dental operatory while the child's being taken care of. So that's my contribution. Well, and while I've got you, Dr. Casamassimo, my next question is for you, because we have a number of people in the audience who are non-dental people. So if you could just kind of briefly tell us, you know, what is what is the long-term impact of, of these photos you showed in your presentation where children have a number of cavities? I mean, is it just a matter of fixing those cavities and then hopefully preventing them, or are there more long-term effects from all of this decay in young well, children? Well, it, it's, you know, they're, they're, they're both. Uh, the immediate thing is we know that that 40% uh, in many places uh, uh, in the country of children in the preschool children have tooth decay and about 10% of those are experiencing pain, which means that the teeth potentially are abscessed or about to abscess. And uh, that can lead to a cellulitis or an airway problem and, and a requirement to go to uh, an emergency room if they can't find a dentist to take care of them. So. Um, and then the long-term consequences, tooth loss, and uh, uh, that creates all kinds of problems with orthodontics and tooth straightening and, and uh, dental caries. Once you've acquired it in childhood, uh, you're pretty much condemned to it throughout your life unless you really, really work to, to change that. Oh, and I'll add to that. I know from um, work that surveillance work that our program has done here, 52% um, of children in kindergarten have experienced tooth decay here in Texas. Experienced means that when we saw them, they may have a filling, it may have been treated or it may be untreated, but either way, they've had the experience of having cavities. So yeah, 52% here by the time they're in kindergarten. Um, Kelly, so I've never received nutritional counseling um, from a dietitian, and I'm assuming probably most of our audience hasn't. Um, so can you tell us, you know, what is nutritional counseling like and what all does a dietitian do? Usually a dietitian will take the information, uh, medical information that you have. Most people that seek counseling from a dietitian have a, some sort of issue they're trying to correct. Uh, whether it's uh, weight loss, if there's a, a thyroid issue, diabetes, et cetera. So what we do typically is we, um, we get their medical labs. We look over those medical labs in relationship to the issue that we're speaking of there. We analyze that. And then we also get uh, a good, informa good information from them on their eating habits, what they typically have, a typical day would be. We might even have them take a, di a food diary for a few days so that we can get a better idea of what's going on and then we can make the appropriate recommendations. I do not like to give someone a pie in the sky recommendation. I want to know what they're doing now and what changes we can make there uh, because it's, it, we need to be realistic and that's the most important thing is just be realistic with people's lives with the way that they live and try to make recommendations that they're going to be able to easily accommodate into their regular everyday life. Otherwise they will just won't, it won't, they won't stick to it over time. Thank you. Um, so Karen, um, we were, we were talking earlier about policies related to, you know, vending machines, having sugar sweetened beverages. And you and I had talked about it a little bit before this presentation. Um, and I was able to find um, a little bit more recent information than what I was telling you before um, from a weighted survey of school principals in Texas from 2018, um, where they asked um, what students had available to them in vending machines. Um, for high, I have this for high school and middle school, but not for elementary. Um, for chocolate candy, 15% of high school students had that available to purchase in a vending machine, um, almost 13% for middle school. Um, and for non low fat carbohydrate kind of, you know, pastries, crackers, those sorts of things, um, they were both in the low 20%. Um, but, and then what I'm getting to, which is my question for you, um, soda is still higher than I would like to see, but about 24% of high school students have it available and um, close to 13%. But sports drinks, there's quite a significant increase. It goes from 44% to almost 24%. Everybody, or it feels like there's the perception that sports drinks are okay and that they're a necessary part of when children exert themselves in any, in any form or fashion. So can you tell us, um, is there really a true health benefit to sports drinks and are they necessary for say a soccer practice? 
So, so based on um, typical exercise, water prior to exercise would be the wet, best way to hydrate um, before you begin the exercise. So start in the morning if you know you're going to be out in the heat and working or a, a soccer game or practice as you use it as an example. Uh, the, the sports drinks do have some electrolyte potential there, and that can be helpful, but for as much of a sports drink as you drink, you need to drink that much water as well to be sure that you're hydrating. Um, and the consideration for the sports drinks is the amount of sugar. There's still a lot of sugar there. So uh, again, um, offsetting that with, with good old water from the tap is really going to be your best bet for hydrating. Thank you. Um, this question is, is for both Kelly and Dr. Casamassimo, so I'll let you answer in that order. Um, we, so we all have a limited time when we're, you know, in, in whichever professional capacity we're in, seeing our patients or clients. Um, how do we have a brief conversation with our patients or clients about reducing their sugar consumption? And I've even seen research that shows, you know, that sometimes when talking with someone who is obese about their diet and obesity, that, you know, that that can have a, a a negative impact on health behaviors. So how do, we ha how do we have a brief conversation on this topic with our limited time and keep it from backfiring on us? I have uh, just basic questions that I ask for with, that I use motivational interviewing with. In, in other words, I let the patient tell me, they're asking me a question that, so I come back with a question of, well, what are, what are the issues that you're having now? And I have them tell me a little bit about you know, a couple of sentences about where, where they are so that they'd be more specific about what they're asking, what they're wanting to know, because I have a lot of information. They don't need all that information in two seconds or two minutes. Uh, so I have them uh, answer a couple of questions first so I can tell it, narrow down exactly what they're asking. A lot of times they're wanting to just re reduce their overall calorie intake. If that's the situation, the first thing is, do you drink soda pop? Do you put things in your coffee? Do you drink sugared um, or sweetened teas? Things of that sort. And that's in their beverages is where they can cut back on a lot of that first right out of the box. And they can keep from having, that, that cuts back on a lot of calorie consumption and sugar consumption right there. So I usually just try to get a, a an, get an idea of what they're specifically wanting to know so I can answer that quickly. If it's, a, it's just, just a, say, we're walking down, you know, going down the elevator and I'm giving them a, a couple of tips as we go down the elevator, something along those lines. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm at an advantage because I take care of kids. And so, uh, you know, you're, you can always use guilt and love and manipulation. And so um, if you can approach a parent and say, you know, your child has, has some tooth decay. Can we talk about diet and what can we do? And, um, uh, you know, we've all heard of motivational interviewing and I call this motivational interviewing light because you, you just say, you know, what one thing can we do? What one area do you think we can work on to reduce the amount of sugar? And, and then I try to supplement anything that they suggest as an area of, of uh, address by giving them practical solutions and, and not just say, get rid of it, get rid of it, but just say, you know, okay, let's start here and work. And, and this is one big step you can take. So it might be going to bed with a bottle or something like that where we can address that. But, you know, throw a little guilt in there and, and, you know, we know, I know you love your baby. You know, we can always say that and, and, uh, and, and use that as a motivator. Thank you. Um, boy, I'm looking at where the time has gone. I, and, and I've got so many other questions that I would love to ask, but I do want to get some from the audience. So if y'all can, as I ask these questions, if you can just keep your answer, you know, as brief as you can, so we can try to get in as many. Um, and one is, is, I'll say sort of a question for me. I see a question of why is the health department still allowing unhealthy sugars? 
Um, and I will do my best to, to try to answer that um, without my commissioner standing here to give me the thumbs up of whether I'm giving the right answer or not. But I don't think that we as the health department has the authority to make that decision. I, I think uh, my guess is I think that's got to be a legislative decision. Um, we, we are not a governing body where we can dictate um, what's going to happen with that. So that's, that's my short answer, like I said, without my commissioner giving me the thumbs up, that I just don't think that we've got the authority for that. Um, Kelly, what advice can you give a community health worker to share in a community where type 2 diabetes is prevalent? Oh, my, there's lots of information. Um, or maybe to, point to a good source of, of where okay. to find that information. Okay. The the best if you're wanting if you're wanting to find a dietitian in your community, um, the best way to do that is to look under um, uh, the the uh, eatright.org. They have a lot of people who are part of those that I myself and many are part of our professional organization, and you can find someone in your area that that way, but also through just Googling. But if you Google, you need to Google dietitian, not nutritionist. Our, our license is registered dietitian and they've added nutritionist at the end. So now it's RDN or RD. So registered dietitian, nutritionist or registered dietitian. Um, it always has to have nutrition dietitian in it. If you just Google nutritionist, you're not going to get someone that has the credentialed education behind them okay. necessarily. Thank you. Um, I've, there's a question here. Are you aware of a drink tax initiative that has stalled in the house? Um, and to that, I will, I'm going to turn that question a little bit to ask Dr. Casamassimo what he thinks about soda taxes that have been, um, that other states or cities have used. How has that, has that been successful for them to have soda taxes? It, it's, it's a mixed bag. It's, um, uh, you know, sometimes it's worked. I think California has had success with it. Um, I don't know. I think Philadelphia maybe had less success. Uh, they did it. I'm not sure what other places have tried it. You know, people will, will figure out ways to get sugar containing beverages. And then there are, are complaints about, um, well, you take this away from me. How do I hydrate my kids and how do I get uh, nutrition or how do I get energy into my kids? Um, and so, uh, uh, it, it's it's a very difficult thing, and I think it, it the, when those laws are will work, they have to be well crafted, well thought out, and, and not be discriminatory. I think, and and that's a real challenge for legislators to uh, come up with. They need the help of these two ladies that uh, are uh, on the panel with me to, if if in fact they're considering that, because um, you know there's a lot involved with with structuring those kinds of uh, initiatives. Well, y'all, we are at 201 now, um, and I'm really, I, I, there's so much more I would love to ask. I really appreciate all of you um, being here today and participating in the panel. Here on, you, on your screen now, you see the contact information. Um, I saw there were a number of questions, Kelly, about different types of artificial sweeteners. So I think you may have some questions coming your way and I apologize that we weren't able to get to those um, during the panel discussion. But the, the speakers offer their emails for a reason. If you have questions, please ask them, ask the panelists your questions. They'll be happy to help you with those. Um, Beth, I'll turn over to you for any final announcements. And again, thank you, everybody. We really appreciate our panelists, and we appreciate all of you for being in the audience today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Stokely and panelists for a wonderful and informative presentation. You all did a wonderful job, and um, I'm sure lots of attendees will follow up with uh, additional questions.